Welcome to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast. This is episode 22. Last time, Zhang Fei just couldn't help himself and decided to poke Li Bu with a stick again by stealing some horses that his men had just purchased. Li Bu responded by bringing an army to Xiaopei, where Liu Bei was based, to dish out some payback. And imagine Liu Bei's surprise when he rode out to ask why Li Bu was there with an army, only to find out for the first time what Zhang Fei had done. Then Zhang Fei precluded any possibility of a peaceful settlement by hurling more insults at Li Bu and dragging up the old grudge of Li Bu stealing his brother's province. The war of words quickly escalated, and Li Bu ordered his army to surround the hamlet. Inside the city, after he chilled Zhang Fei out, Liu Bei sent a messenger to Li Bu's camp to say that he would return all the stolen horses if Li Bu would just call off his attack. Li Bu was leaning toward accepting this peace offering, but his advisor Chen Gong was against it. If you don't kill Liu Bei now, he will definitely do you harm down the road, Chen Gong said. So Li Bu changed his mind and rejected the truce offering. So now what was Liu Bei going to do? He gathered his staff to figure that out, and one of his advisors, Sun Qian, offered up an idea out of left field. Cao Cao hates Li Bu more than anyone else, Sun Qian said. Why don't we abandon the city and go to Xuchang to seek refuge with Cao Cao and borrow his troops to defeat Li Bu? So let's pause here and refresh our memory. Cao Cao may hate Li Bu, but he wasn't exactly a fan of Liu Bei either. Not since Liu Bei interfered with his attempt to raise Xu province to the ground to avenge his father's death. And remember that Cao Cao also devised a few tricks to try to goad Liu Bei and Lü Bu into fighting each other, and this was partly what led to Lü Bu taking the province away from Liu Bei. So it was definitely a risky move for Liu Bei to join his enemy, but then again it's not like he had a whole lot of options given how few troops and provisions he had so he better hope that Cao Cao agrees with the old sentiment that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Who will lead the way and break through the siege? Liu Bei asked. Zhang Fei immediately volunteered, and so Liu Bei placed him at the front of his forces. He ordered Guan Yu to bring up the rear, while he himself was in the middle of the army, protecting his family. Around 11 o'clock that night, under the light of the moon, they stormed out of the north gate. Two of Lü Bu's officers, Song Xian and Wei Xu, blocked their path, but they were fought off by Zhang Fei. Liu Bei and company managed to fight their way out. Zhang Liao, one of Lü Bu's top generals, gave chase, but Guan Yu kept him at bay. Seeing that Liu Bei had made his way out, Lü Bu didn't really bother to pursue, choosing to enter the city instead. He left the general Gao Shun in charge of the city, and then took his forces back to Xu province. After they broke out, Liu Bei and company made straight for Xuchang. When they got there, they first set up camp outside the city, and then sent Sun Qian to go see Cao Cao to tell him that they were on the outs with Lü Bu and had come to seek refuge. Liu Bei and I are like brothers, Cao Cao said. Which, um, okay if you say so. But in any case, Cao Cao invited Liu Bei to enter the city and to meet with him. The next day, Liu Bei left Guan Yu and Zhang Fei outside the city and went to see Cao Cao, accompanied only by Sun Qian and Mi Zhu, two civil advisors, which was a pretty gutsy move on his part considering that he didn't really know what Cao Cao was going to do. As it turned out, Cao Cao treated him like an honored guest. Liu Bei recounted what happened with Lü Bu, and Cao Cao promised to join forces with Quote, you, my good brother, to eliminate that dishonorable dog, unquote. Liu Bei thanked him, and Cao Cao threw a banquet to welcome Liu Bei before sending him back to his camp that night. After Liu Bei left, two of Cao Cao's advisors came in to see him. First, it was Xun Yu, who told Cao Cao, Liu Bei is a hero of the times. If you don't eliminate him now, he will be a thorn in your side later. To this, Cao Cao gave no answer. After Xun Yu left, Guo Jia came in. Xun Yu advised me to kill Liu Bei. What should I do? Cao Cao asked Guo Jia. You cannot, Guo Jia replied. 
You are raising an honorable army to rid the common people of their oppressors. Your reputation of being a man of honor and good faith has drawn many men of talent to your banner. Liu Bei has the reputation of a hero, and he is coming to you in a time of distress. If you kill him, you would draw the suspicion of capable men throughout the realm, and they would not come to join you any more. Then who would help you bring peace to the country? Eliminating this one threat would alienate many. You must weigh the pros and cons. Sir, you took the words right out of my mouth, Cao Cao said. The next day, Cao Cao prepared a memorial to the emperor, suggesting that Liu Bei be appointed the imperial protector of Yu province. Another of his advisors, Cheng Yu, suggested that he do away with Liu Bei sooner than later. But Cao Cao rejected this. We need capable men right now, Cao Cao said. We cannot alienate the country by killing one man. On this point, Guo Jia and I are of one mind. So Cao Cao gave 3,000 troops and 10,000 bushels of grain to Liu Bei and sent him to Yu province, where he was to advance on Xiao Pei, gather his former soldiers who had scattered when he fled, and then attack Lü Bu. After taking his post, Liu Bei sent word to Cao Cao to coordinate when they were going to rendezvous and attack Lü Bu. Just as Cao Cao was preparing to mobilize his army, however, something else demanded his attention. Cao Cao received an urgent report that Zhang Ji had died. If you need a refresher, Zhang Ji was one of Dong Zhuo's lieutenants, and he was pretty much the last one of that bunch still standing after Li Jue and Guo Si's fall from power. He gained some prestige and power when he enforced a truce between those two guys when they were at each other's throats. But while laying siege to Nanyang, he was struck by an arrow and died. The control of his forces then fell to his nephew, Zhang Xiu. With the help of Jia Xu, a capable advisor who once served Li Jue and Guo Si, Zhang Xiu struck up a coalition with Liu Biao, the imperial protector of Jing province. Currently, Zhang Xiu had stationed his army at Wancheng and was thinking about attacking Xu Chang and seizing the emperor. Cao Cao was obviously not amused at this news and wanted to go put Zhang Xiu in his place. However, he was also worried about Lü Bu taking advantage of his absence and attacking Xu Chang while he was away, so he consulted with Xun Yu. Oh, that's easy, Xun Yu said. Lü Bu is a fool and is easily pleased with a little treat. You can send a messenger to Xu province to give him a promotion and a reward and order him to make peace with Liu Bei. This will satisfy Lü Bu, and he would not try to get more. Cao Cao agreed and did as Xun Yu suggested. He then mobilized 150,000 troops to take care of Zhang Xiu. He split them into three armies that he personally led, with Xia Hou Dun heading up the vanguard. When this huge army drew near and camped out by the Yu River, it gave Zhang Xiu and company second thoughts about the whole invading the capital plan. On the advice of Jia Xu, Zhang Xiu decided to surrender, so he sent Jia Xu to Cao Cao's camp to negotiate the terms. Cao Cao immediately took a liking to Jia Xu after seeing how smoothly he handled every question, and he wanted to bring Jia Xu into his own service, but Jia Xu refused. I once served Li Jue, which was an offense to all under heaven, he said. Right now I am serving Zhang Xiu, and he listens to my advice so I cannot bear to abandon him. And so Jia Xu took his leave. The next day, Zhang Xiu went to Cao Cao's camp, and Cao Cao treated him well. Cao Cao then led part of his army into Wancheng, while the rest remained camped outside the city, with the tents stretching on for miles. Cao Cao then spent the next few days in the city, with Zhang Xiu throwing a feast for him every single day. One day, after another one of these feasts, Cao Cao retired to his quarters drunk. He asked his attendants, Are there any courtesans in this city? Cao Cao's nephew, Cao Anmin, caught his drift and told him in private, Last night I saw a rare beauty near the local inn. I asked around and found out that she was the wife of Zhang Xiu's uncle, Zhang Ji. Cao Cao then ordered his nephew to lead 50 soldiers to go fetch the lady. They returned soon thereafter, and the woman was indeed a delight to behold. 
When Cao Cao asked for her name, she answered that she was Lady Zhou, the widow of Zhang Ji. Does your ladyship know who I am? Cao Cao asked. I have long heard of your great name, and it is my great fortune to be in your presence, she answered. It was only for your sake that I decided to accept Zhang Xiu's surrender instead of exterminating his whole clan. Lady Zhou prostrated herself and said, Thank you for your great kindness. It is my fortune to meet you today, Cao Cao said. I would like for you to share my bed tonight, and then follow me back to Xuchang to live a life of luxury. What do you think? Lady Zhou prostrated herself again and thanked Cao Cao, and she spent the night in his tent. But she also cautioned Cao Cao, If we stay in the city for long, it will surely arouse suspicion and make people talk. Well, then tomorrow we will go stay in my camp outside the city, Cao Cao said. The next day, they moved out of the city and moved into Cao Cao's camp. Cao Cao ordered Dian Wei, one of his top warriors, to stay outside his tent and to stand guard. No one else may enter without being summoned. Thanks to this arrangement, there was little communication going in and out of Cao Cao's tent, and he was too enraptured with Lady Zhou to think about returning to the capital. But something like this just wasn't going to stay a secret for long. Zhang Xiu's servants caught wind of this and reported it to him, and Zhang Xiu was naturally enraged at this humiliation. He met with Jia Xu to discuss what to do. Jia Xu told him to keep a lid on this matter for the time being, and to do this and that when he next met with Cao Cao. The next day, Zhang Xiu went to Cao Cao's tent and said, Many of the newly surrendered soldiers have deserted. I would like to request your permission to move my troops to the middle of your camp to prevent more from deserting. Cao Cao consented, and Zhang Xiu moved his men, who now were stationed in four locations in the heart of Cao Cao's camp, near Cao Cao's own tent, just waiting for the right opportunity to act. But they all knew that Dian Wei was standing guard outside Cao Cao's tent, and they were all well aware of his reputation, so they did not dare to move against Cao Cao yet. Zhang Xiu then consulted his lieutenant, Hu Cher'er, on what to do about Dian Wei. This Hu Cher'er was a remarkable man in his own right, as he could lift 600 pounds and walk 200 miles in one day. But of course, instead of drawing on these strengths, Zhang Xiu was asking him for ideas, and he offered one up. What makes Dian Wei really fearsome is his twin halberds, Hu Cher'er said. Tomorrow, you should invite him to your tent for a feast, and get him drunk before letting him return to his tent. I will sneak into the ranks of his soldiers, slip into his tent, and steal his halberds. Then we would have nothing to fear. You're probably saying, Wait a second, there are plenty of things that make Dian Wei fearsome other than his halberds. This sounds like a half-baked plan. Well, fully baked or half-baked, Zhang Xiu was going with it, and he sent out word for his men to get ready. The next day, he ordered Jia Xu to invite Dian Wei to his tent and treated him to lots and lots of booze. By the time night fell, Dian Wei was good and drunk. Hu Cher sneaked in among Dian Wei's men, and returned to their camp. That same night, Cao Cao was in his own tent, drinking with Lady Zhou. Suddenly, he heard people and horses outside his tent, and he sent an attendant to see what was going on. He returned and said it was just Zhang Xiu on a night patrol, so Cao Cao did not pay it any mind. Around 9 p.m., Cao Cao suddenly heard shouts coming from his camp, and word came that a cartload of hay had caught on fire. This is just an accident. Do not panic, Cao Cao said. But he was wrong. Soon, more stuff started catching on fire all around the camp. Now it was Cao Cao's turn to panic, and he called out for Dian Wei. Dian Wei had just fallen into a drunken stupor when he was awoken by the sound of gongs and the cries of battle. He leaped to his feet, but his halberds were nowhere to be found. By now, the enemy was already at the camp entrance. Dian Wei grabbed the knife from a foot soldier, but by then, countless enemy soldiers with long spears were pouring into the camp, heading toward Cao Cao's tent. Dian Wei charged forward and cut down twenty-some enemy soldiers, convincing the enemy cavalry to fall back, 
But just then, Zhang Xiu's infantry showed up, and they started poking at Dian Wei with long spears. Dian Wei, who had not a shred of armor on him, was stabbed dozens of times, but still, he kept on fighting. By now, his knife's edge had been worn down and couldn't cut anything anymore. So he tossed the knife aside and just grabbed two enemy soldiers and used them as weapons. And he managed to beat eight or nine guys to death with their own comrades. So yeah, there was definitely more to Dian Wei than just his halberds. This display of ferocity kept Zhang Xiu's men at bay, as none of them dared to venture near Dian Wei. Instead, they stayed back and rained down arrows on him. Even as he was struck by the arrows, Dian Wei still stood his ground by the camp entrance. However, by now the enemy had breached the rear of the camp, and Dian Wei took another spear in his back. He let out a number of loud cries and bled to death. Still, no one dared to come in through the front entrance long after he was dead. Dian Wei's self-sacrifice bought Cao Cao the precious time he needed to hop on a horse and flee out of the back of the camp, with only his nephew Cao Anmin following on foot. Cao Cao took an arrow in the right arm, and his horse was also struck by three arrows. But that horse was a fine steed, and kept running despite the pain. When they came upon the Yu River, Zhang Xiu's forces caught up to them, and they cut Cao Anmin to pieces. Cao Cao managed to cross the river, but as soon as he got up onto the opposite bank, an arrow struck his horse in the eye, and the horse tumbled to the ground. But just then, his eldest son Cao Ang arrived and gave Cao Cao his horse. Cao Cao took it and rode away, but Cao Ang was killed by a shower of arrows. Cao Cao managed to escape the immediate danger, and he met up with scattered remnants of his forces along the way and began to regroup. In the midst of all the chaos of the night, some of Cao Cao's own soldiers, namely the Qing province army under the command of Xia Hu Dun, lost their sense of discipline and instead took the opportunity to loot and pillage in the surrounding villages. Another of Cao Cao's generals, Hu Jin, saw this and led his own troops in to kill these troublemakers and protect the villagers. But some of these troublemakers got away and ran off to tell Cao Cao that Yu Jin had rebelled and was killing his troops. Cao Cao was shocked to hear this, and when his general Xiao Dun, Xu Chu, Li Dian, and Yue Jin arrived a short while later, he told them that Yu Jin had rebelled and ordered them to prepare their forces to face him. When Yu Jin heard that Cao Cao and company were arriving, he told his men to entrench. One of his men asked him, Someone told the prime minister that you have turned against him. Now that he is here, why do you worry about entrenching instead of going to see him first to clear yourself? The enemy forces are right behind them and will be here any minute, Yu Jin said. If we do not prepare first, how will we fight back? Clearing myself is insignificant. Fending off the enemy is what's important. And won't you know it? As soon as his forces got done entrenching, Zhang Xiu's army arrived. Yu Jin went out to face the enemy, and Cao Cao's other generals, seeing Yu Jin charging out, led their own forces forward as well. Zhang Xiu's army was routed and fell back. With his forces depleted, Zhang Xiu led the remnants of his army to go join up with Liu Biao. With the enemy defeated, Cao Cao then called his army back to camp. Only now did Yu Jin go to see him and tell him that the Qing province army had been looting and disturbing the common people, and that that's why he had to kill them. Why did you choose to entrench instead of telling me this first? Cao Cao asked. Yu Jin gave him the same answer as before, and Cao Cao was full of praise. General, in the midst of all the chaos, you were able to organize your men and entrench. You were unmoved by slander, undaunted by toil, and turned defeat into victory. Even the greatest generals of old cannot do any better. And so Cao Cao rewarded Yu Jin with a pair of gold vessels and made him the lord of the Yi Shou district. He also scolded Xia Hu Dun for not instilling discipline among his men. With that done, Cao Cao then performed sacrifices to honor Dian Wei. Cao Cao wept as he personally offered the sacrifice, and he told his commanders, 
although I have lost my eldest son and my favorite nephew, neither hurts more than the loss of Dian Wei. This remark moved everyone. The next day, Cao Cao gave the order to return to the capital, and we're going to leave him there for now and flash back to catch up with Lü Bu. Remember that before Cao Cao has set out to pacify Zhang Xiu, he has sent a messenger to Xu province to offer Lü Bu a promotion to keep him at bay. Lü Bu greeted the messenger, who read aloud the imperial decree which bestowed a generalship upon Lü Bu. The messenger then gave him a personal letter from Cao Cao and conveyed to him just how much Cao Cao respected and admired him. All of this made Lü Bu very happy. Just then, a messenger arrived from Yuan Shu, and Lü Bu summoned him. This messenger said, My lord is going to become emperor soon, at which time he will name his successor, so he wishes for you to send your daughter to Huainan soon so his son can marry her. How dare that rebel! Li Bu said angrily. He ordered his men to execute Yuan Shu's messenger. He then put Han Yin, the official that Yuan Shu had sent to play matchmaker, in chains. He then ordered one of his officials, Chen Deng, to accompany Cao Cao's messenger back to the capital, along with a thank you note and Han Yin. In addition to saying thanks, Li Bu's letter to Cao Cao also included a request to be named the imperial protector of Xu province. When Cao Cao got the letter and learned that Li Bu had refused Yuan Shu's marriage proposal, he was delighted. He then had Han Yin beheaded in public. Chen Deng then said to Cao Cao in private, Li Bu is like a jackal. He is all brawn and no brain, and his loyalty is fickle. It is best to eliminate him sooner rather than later. I have long known that he has the heart of a wolf and cannot be kept for long, Cao Cao replied. You and your father know him better than anyone. I will depend on your counsel in this matter. When your excellency is ready to make a move, I will be your inside man, Chen Deng said. Cao Cao then named Chen Deng the governor of Guangling and rewarded his father with a stipend. When Chen Deng was about to head back to Xu province, Cao Cao took his hand and said, The affairs of the East are now in your hands. Chen Deng nodded and took his leave. When he got back to Xu province, he went to see Lü Bu, and Lü Bu asked him how things went in the capital. My father received a stipend, and I was appointed a governor, Chen Deng answered. Lü Bu was outraged. Instead of requesting the imperial protectorship for me, you were more worried about your own gangs. Your father advised me to join with Cao Cao and refused Yuan Shu's marriage proposal, but now I have not been granted any of my requests, while you two have reaped the rewards. You and your father have sold me out. At this, Lü Bu pulled out his sword and was just about to kill Chen Deng, but Chen Deng simply laughed. <laughs> General, you have misunderstood. How so? When I saw the Prime Minister, I told him that keeping you is like keeping a tiger. You must feed the tiger enough meat, or it would start to eat people. Cao Cao laughed and said, Not so. My treatment of General Lü is like keeping an eagle. As long as there are still foxes and rabbits to be hunted down, I dare not feed the eagle too much. As long as the ego is still hungry, it will hunt, but once it is full, it will leave me. So I asked Cao Cao who were the foxes and the rabbits, and he said, Yuan Shu, Sun Ce, Yuan Shao, Liu Biao, Liu Zhang, and Zhang Lu. Upon hearing this, Li Bu tossed his sword aside and laughed. <laughs> Cao Cao really does know me. And so he was content to drop the matter for the moment. Just then, though, came another new development. Scouts reported that Yuan Shu had mobilized his army and was coming to take Xu province. So let's back up for just a little bit and see what's been happening with Yuan Shu. As we mentioned earlier, he had made a nice little empire for himself in Huainan, and he had been thinking about declaring himself emperor. So he assembled his officials and said to them, the supreme ancestor started out as nothing more than the head of a precinct, and yet he won an empire. After 400 years, that empire has run its course, 
and rebellion is everywhere. My family has held high office for four generations, and we enjoy the confidence of the people. I intend to comply with the will of heaven and men, and declare myself emperor. What do you all think? But Ge Xiang, the first secretary, was against it. That cannot be done. Remember that Hou Ji, the high ancestor of the house of Zhou, had both great virtue and great merit, and yet even in the last days of the Shang dynasty, his house remained loyal to the ruling family. Even the founder of the Zhou dynasty, King Wen, did not overthrow the Shang even though he controlled two-thirds of the realm. My lord, your family may be prestigious, but it does not yet match that of the house of Zhou, and although the house of Han is weak, it has not sunken to the brutality of the house of Shang. Thus you cannot proceed. But Yuan Shu was not in the mood for no. He cited some mumbo-jumbo about how the order of the elements and prognostications about the name of the one who shall supplant the Han were all pointing to him as the ordained successor to the throne, and he declared that anyone else who dares to oppose his plan would be executed. That pretty much ended the discussion, and he went ahead with the coronation ceremony, where he rode in on an imperial litter, performed rituals at the northern and southern ends of the city, and named his empress and his successor. While he was naming his son the successor, it came up that, oh yeah, his son was supposed to marry Lü Bu's daughter. But then he got word that Lü Bu had already sent the matchmaker, Han Yin, to Cao Cao for execution. Needless to say, this was too much of an outrage for his new royal highness, so Yuan Shu appointed Zhang Xun as his grand commander and put him at the head of more than 200,000 troops. These forces were divided into seven field armies, and they all made for Xu province to exact revenge. The guy he initially put in charge of provisions for the armies declined the job, so Yuan Shu had him executed to show everyone that he meant business. He then ordered the general Ji Ling to serve as backup to the seven armies, while Yuan Shu himself led 30,000 men to drive the lines forward and to oversee reinforcements. When Li Bu got word that seven armies were headed toward various key locations in his province, he immediately assembled his advisors. Among those present were his top strategist Chen Gong, as well as Chen Deng and his father Chen Gui. Even though these three guys shared the same last name, Chen Gong was not related to Chen Deng or Chen Gui. In fact, Chen Gong hated the other two. The calamity that's heading toward Xu province is all the doing of Chen Gui and his son, Chen Gong told Lü Bu. Their advice was designed to curry favor with the court and earn rewards for themselves, and now you are stuck with the consequences. You should execute them both and send their heads to Yuan Shu. His armies would naturally retreat. Hearing this, Lü Bu ordered that Chen Gui and Chen Deng be arrested, but Chen Deng once again laughed out loud. What are you afraid of, he said. To me, these seven armies are but seven piles of rotten straws and are of no concern. If you have an idea that can defeat the enemy, I will spare your lives, Lü Bu said. If you would follow my advice, I can guarantee that Xu province will be safe, Chen Deng said. Tell me your idea, said Lü Bu. Yuan Shu may have a lot of troops, but they are a motley crew with no mutual trust. If we defend our cities and stage surprise raids, we will defeat them easily. I also have another idea that will not only guarantee our province's safety, but could also capture Yuan Shu. What is this idea? Lü Bu asked. Han Xian and Yang Feng, commanders at the heads of two of Yuan Shu's armies, used to be officials of the Han court. But they fled out of fear of Cao Cao and only joined up with Yuan Shu because they had nowhere else to go. I wager that Yuan Shu must have treated them both with little respect, and they must be displeased with him. If you write a letter to convince them to join us and serve as our inside man, and then we add in support from Liu Bei, we will surely capture Yuan Shu. Hmm. 
then you must personally go to deliver the letters to Han Xian and Yang Feng, Li Bu said to Chen Deng. And Chen Deng agreed, so Li Bu sent messengers to Xuchang and Yu province to tell Cao Cao and Liu Bei of the plan. And then he ordered Chen Deng to lead a few riders to head to the path leading to Xia Pi, where Han Xian and Yang Feng were headed. To see how well Chen Deng's words would go over with those two, tune in to the next episode of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast. Thanks for listening.